This is the Woke Daisy. Welcome back, TW Dears. We are so happy to have you back for another episode of The Woke DC, bringing you all things South Asian each Tuesday. I'm Anika. And I'm Nehal. And today, we're here to touch on a beauty standard and condition that sometimes gets overlooked in the South Asian community and judged. We've talked about colorism on our episodes with Nina Devaluri. We've talked about overall beauty standards with Nehal Mehra. And we've talked about fat phobia with Sonali Rashadwar. And today we're talking about alopecia and beauty standards associated with it. Alopecia is a condition that causes hair to fall out in small patches. The immune system essentially attacks hair follicles, but it's not life-threatening or contagious. It can't be prevented or avoided for that matter, but options still exist to mitigate the effects. And there's still multiple types. Hair can grow back. Sometimes it's lost forever. Sometimes a person may lose the hair on their head. Sometimes they may lose it all over their body. And why is that all important? Because we want you to remember that alopecia isn't contagious and it looks different from person to person and carry this with you as you listen to today's episode. We aren't talking so much about alopecia as a condition, but about the people who have alopecia as human beings and what that means for them within the context of being South Asian. So we brought a goddess on board to talk about it. I don't know if you guys follow Nihar Sachdeva, but she's got a giant smile and the girl is gorgeous and smart to boot. And we have her on with us today. Nihar is a representation creator based out of San Antonio slash Austin, Texas, and she uses her social media platforms to talk about normalizing, breaking beauty standards, and her experience as a bald, first-generation South Asian woman. She is all about loving yourself for who you truly are and empowering others to do so as well by defining your own version of beautiful. By day, Nihar is a consultant, and she's also a lover of all things vegan food. So welcome, Nihar. We're really happy to have you here. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm excited. I can't believe you just told me that you know one of my really good friend's sisters. So shout out to you, Ria. Small world. You guys all know each other. So let's start with your experience with alopecia. What was that like? I know Anika got to talk to you beforehand, so I need to know the full story. How has it been? Well, my experience with alopecia has basically been my entire life. I was diagnosed when I was six months old, um, so I obviously don't have any recollection of that. Um, My parents tell me when I was six months old, I started losing my hair. Um, They shaved my head, which is kind of customary, um, a culture in my tradition, um, where when kids are, you know, babies, they'll go ahead and do a mundan, which is a shaving head ceremony. And so they kind of didn't think so much about it because they're like, okay, we have to shave our head anyways. Um, and so we, they shaved my head. They did a little bit of remedies. They took suggestions from, you know, the doctors and other people. And my hair did end up growing back within the year. Um, it was a concern that my parents still had, like she has this condition. What does this mean? So my parents packed their bags. We were living in India. I was born in India and they packed their bags and they moved to the U.S. So still today, my parents say that the only reason that they came to the U.S. was because of my alopecia and because of me. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been here. And so we moved to the U.S. I had all my hair grow back. And then about when I was six years old, five or six years old, um, I lost an eyebrow. And that was my first kind of real memory um, that I could think back on of me having alopecia. And that was the first, you know, time that I kind of realized, okay, this is something that is different. This is this is not a normal thing that everyone has. Um, you know, most people have two eyebrows. I only have one. And sometimes when, you know, we would go to family parties or larger events, my mom would just take a little, you know, gajal pencil, black eyeliner, and kind of pencil in my brow, just thinking, you know, let's just, you know, we're getting ready for the party. She's doing her makeup. Let me just do a little bit of your makeup. And obviously no bad intentions there. My mom was just being, doing what was best for me, but that was the first kind of memory that I have. Um, And then as time went on, I was about nine years old in fourth grade when I started really losing the hair on my head. I had a few patches um, scattered on my scalp, you know, dime size, quarter size, depending on where they were. I, you could, you couldn't really see it. It was really easily hidden behind all of my, you know, 
thick, heavy Indian hair. Um, but then as time went on, I kept on losing more and more hair. Um, fifth grade, I lost more hair. I started sixth grade actually wearing a hat because I had lost so much hair and the patches weren't as easily covered. And after winter break in sixth grade, coming back to school, um, my parents actually went and took me to get a wig because my, my, even with the hat on my head, you could still tell, you know, there, there was something wrong. She doesn't have enough hair. So my parents went and took, took me to get a wig when I was in sixth grade. And from sixth grade to about 11th grade, um, I wore a wig every single day of my life, all of the time. Doesn't matter what I was doing. Doesn't matter, you know, if there was one random person that came to the door to knock and, or if we had a huge family gathering or if it was just for school, I was always wearing my wig. Um, it was something that I felt like I was hiding behind for so many years. Um, when I stopped wearing my wig, it was the summer before my senior year of high school and a huge chunk of my hair, almost all of my hair had grown back completely. I had some patches, um, very, very small patches that you could barely see. And so I stopped wearing a wig. My senior year was the best year because, you know, I was, I was able to go to school. I was able to curl my hair, straighten my hair, just be myself without constantly thinking about the fact that I was wearing a wig. Um, and then my, towards the end of my first semester of senior year, I started losing my hair again. And as I was losing my hair again, I was like, oh no, what am I going to do? And my parents were like, oh no, what are you going to do? Every single day they would say, you know, what are we going to do? Do you want to go look at other wigs? We tried a handful of different treatments, um, you know, throughout my time with alopecia from fourth grade to my senior year of high school, there was a, a variety of topical steroids, ointments, treatments, hair loss, Rogaine, all of these things, Ayurvedic treatments, homeopathic treatments. We tried it all, every single thing. And um, yeah, I was losing my hair and we did a one final like, okay, let's try steroid shots in the head. So steroid shots, like you mentioned earlier, um, there is no treatment or cure for alopecia. You can do different things to kind of make it better. Some people have great successes with it. It doesn't work for other people. Everyone's body is completely different. And st steroid shots had a reputation of, you know, this is kind of a miracle treatment. If it works, it can really work and you won't have alopecia again. Um, and in my case, it kind of backfired. We did the steroid shots and instead of my hair growing back, rapidly it was losing rapidly and we kind of ran out of all the options my parents said okay let's go look at more wigs and I said I can't do that anymore and then I decided to shave my head well I'm looking at you now and you are rocking the shaved head like holy crap you're gorgeous thank you how did you get comfortable kind of rocking that where was that transition like from going from wearing a wig and then deciding that you're going to shave your head and own it. Yeah, it was um, one of the biggest, you know, transitions, big moments of my life for sure. I, so like I was saying, my parents would ask me, you know, every single day, what are we going to do? Should we go look at wigs? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? And I was just so fed up with the concept or like just thinking about my hair all the time. I was so fed up with, I was like, I have been w wearing wigs for years. I just barely got a taste of that life. You know, I just barely got that. And now you're going to suck me back in into the wig wearing, hiding behind something. And I was like, I can't do that. And so every time my parents would ask me, I would kind of just in spite of them, I was a very, I'm sure my parents, it was a really rough teenager to them, but every single time I would, you know, just say, I'm just going to shave my head just to spite them. And one day I remember my mom calling me out on it and saying, you're in denial. You're not going to shave your head. So let's think of an actual solution to this. And then that's kind of when it, you know, lit a fire. And I was like, but why am I not going to shave my head? Why, why am I, why wouldn't I do that? And then that thought kind of got planted in my head and I was thinking about it. And I um, talked to, um, my best friends and I talked to them about it. They were super supportive. Um, I was, a, I had a high school boyfriend at the time. I talked to him about it. He was the most supportive and, you know, 
that extra external validation is always really nice. I talked to my sister, my brother-in-law about it. They were super supportive. And then I talked to my parents about it and they were not, not supportive. Um, I think that they were really, they knew the toll that this had taken on my life. And they knew that, you know, that wearing a wig wasn't the best option. And so they were willing to listen to me and, and I expressed what I wanted to say. And I think they were supportive that I wanted to do this, but they were also very, very worried. They were worried about what people were going to think. We live, I'm from the Bay Area. So um, lots of, you know, Indian community, brown people, judgment. Um, and so that was always a concern. And my grandma, she was kind of like, you know, if you shave your head, who's going to marry you? And when she said that, I had kind of a revelation that I still, I still always bring up today that that was kind of the moment that I was like, this is something that I need to do. Um, if not for me, but for everyone else, um, because if, you know, if someone's not going to marry me because I don't have hair on my head, why would I ever want to marry someone like that? And I think after those conversations, after, you know, my grandma said that, I talked to my parents, they were apprehensive, but they were, you know, okay, fine. If this is what you're, you want to do, we're going to stand by you. And they're like, okay, let's do it. After those conversations, I was kind of very strong-willed that this is a decision that I want to make. And this is something that I want to follow through with. I talked to like my principal at school. I talked to a couple other people and everyone is overall pretty supportive, just a little bit worried about what the outcome was going to be the unknown. And so to mitigate the out the like unknown and just to make sure that this really meant this really went how it should go. I told my mom that I wanted to throw a party to shave my head. I was like, I don't want to just shave my head and walk, walk into school and have to worry about and think about constantly what everyone's thinking about. I'm going to throw a party. And so I threw um, a bald bash hashtag Nihar's bald bash. And I like threw this, it was my closest friends, um, closest family. It was just at my, at my house, but it was definitely like a, you know, party for the gram party for myself. Um, and so I had all my friends come over. Um, my dad was the one that shaved my head. He shaved my head and my friends were all there. We took a bunch of pictures and then I kind of released it to social media. I put it on my Facebook. I put it on my Instagram. My friends put it on their, um, you know, social medias. My mom and my sister, everyone kind of put on their social medias. And it was a very much, I wanted to make a powerful statement. I wanted to make a statement that I'm not sad. I'm not sitting here crying about the fact that I don't have hair. I'm celebrating it. And when I was planning the party, my mom was very apprehensive, like more so about less less than more apprehensive about me throwing a party than me shaving my head. She was kind of like, what is this drama? Like, what is the point of doing all this? Why do you have to make it such a big statement? Um, let's just be hush hush. Like, let's do it. Okay. You want to do it, but why do we have to announce it to the world? And then I said, but that's exactly it. If we do it, hush hush, people are just going to talk. People are just going to be like, Oh my God, why did she shave her head? Oh, her daughter is bald. Did you see what happened? Like how people talk. But if you go and if you just announce it to the world, what is anyone else going to say to you? You should have you should have just said, mom, it's a mundane, but make it litty. <laughs> Literally, that's what it is. Modern day mundane. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that modern day mundane. But yeah. And so I the fact that I threw a party um, I think that changed my experience completely. I think if I had gone gone about it any other way um, and I hadn't done how I had done it, I think the confidence and the way that I present myself to the world, or at least I did at that time, you know, when it was so new, there were so many unknowns. This was completely changing my life. I think it would have been totally different. Um, but how I went about it really impacted the responses and the experience of, you know, walking into the world as a bald Indian girl. And I think there was obviously my peers, everyone at school, everyone in the surrounding schools, like in the Bay Area, 
you know, you have connections all across everywhere. You kind of know everybody. Um, and so everyone saw that on Facebook and social media and they're like, oh, wow, this is so cool. Um, yada, yada, yada. There was people, you know, people that used to bully me when I was younger were coming to me and commenting on my Instagram and talking to me in person, like, wow, that was so badass. Like that was so cool. And I was like, I really just did it because of you. Cause all of y'all were bothering me my entire life about this. Um, and then really the last thing that shaped my experience was, um, my sister got married two months prior to when I shaved my head and she got married in India. And because we were from, um, we lived in the Bay area, we had so many family friends. We threw a reception for her in the Bay with all of our, everyone that we knew. And there was about like what, 250 people at the reception. And it was taking place a week after I shaved my head. And so my mom had asked me if I wanted to wait until after I shaved my head um, until after the reception to shave my head. And I didn't want to, I said, you know, this is the opportunity. This is, this is it. If there's a time to do it, the time is now. And I walked into that wedding reception. It was our reception, but I'm saying I walked into it and everyone was, you could see everyone was surprised. That was the elephant in the room. That was what everyone was concerned about. They weren't concerned about my sister, my brother-in-law. They weren't concerned about the the couple that we were celebrating. They were really concerned about how I just magically um, became bald. And so when I said a speech for my sister and my brother-in-law for you know their wedding to celebrate them as a couple, I took a couple minutes in the beginning um, and talked about myself and just addressed the elephant in the room and told everyone, you know, you guys are the most important people to us. Um, you guys are here and this is what it is. Exactly like you guys said in the beginning, this is not contagious. This is not life-threatening. It's not that big of a deal unless you make it one, you know? And so I told everybody, every single person that we knew that was in our lives was in that room. And I told them in one swift go and no one ever said anything again. And I wanted to do that for my parents. I didn't want my parents to have to answer everyone's questions. Like if there's 215 people, the rest of their life, just answer 250 questions. Why is she bald? What happened? Is she okay? And have that and be ashamed of it. Because while I was comfortable in my skin, I can accept my parents, you know, who were raised in India, moved to the US, didn't have the upbringing that I did. I can expect them to look at this the same way and understand my experiences the same way. So I wanted to do that for them, that they wouldn't have to be questioned. And honestly, my parents are the most supportive people. They, to me now, they, I talked to my mom and she's always just like, who cares? Like, who cares that you don't have hair? And that was not the case. That was not how I grew up, but that's not how it happened. But that's how it became after they saw that it doesn't matter. They saw the love, they saw the support from our family and friends and just strangers and everyone alike. They realized, you know, we always say, what will people think? But they saw that, okay, once you embrace what is true, you be your authentic self, what are people going to say? There's nothing that they have to say. What people are going to come up to them and say, oh my God, your daughter's bald. They'll be like, yes, we know. And... It's so funny because I think that as South Asian communities, we have this tendency, like you said, to put things hush hush and kind of be like, how do we change this narrative so that people can kind of feel more sympathy? How do we look better? How do we make it so that maybe we can, you know, make people feel more compassion or more pity towards somebody for going through something rather than just being like, no, we're not changing the narrative. We're owning the hell out of it. Because if you own it, it does take away a lot of the critiques that people can even give you, you know? And I think that that's a powerful way to make a statement. But I'm sure leading up to it, the people probably still said things that they thought were comforting. Like, for example, we have close family members, my brother and I, who also have alopecia. And I remember my mama texted our family chat and he said, hey, I have some bald spots showing up on my beard. But I wanted all of you to know that there's a chance that you might have it. My mom has a lot of siblings. So she was. they were like, you know, this might be genetic and it might come to you, but I don't want you to worry because it's not contagious. And he had this – it was very sweet, but he had a sit-down, like, conversation over this WhatsApp group. And I remember, partially because I have a health background, maybe, that I looked at it and I said, yeah, and? 
And I was just kind of waiting for the rest of it. Like, is there something worse that's coming after this? You made us, you know, sit down for this conversation. But it ended up just being, hey, I have some bald patches here. It might get worse. It might not. By the way, you guys might have it too. Let's just, you know, keep an eye out, keep checking. And eventually came to a different aunt. And and everybody always has suggestions. Like, well, maybe you're vitamin B deficient. You should start taking vitamins. <laughs> Or That's like, so here's a here's a desi chitka that you can do that might actually help you. Home and remedy. It's almost home remedy. You know, like let me put some turmeric on that that spot and it'll come back. You know, and at some point it gets old. And I'm sure you must have heard so many of those things growing up, and it must have just been so liberating to finally be like, no. This is not the problem. None of these things are working. I am owning the hell out of this. This is just what it is. And I'm just going to wear it, you know, and literally just go out in the world and challenge it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you, everything that you said, I very much experienced. I'm getting flashbacks. I think we went to India one year and we, someone had told my, my parents that in this small village somewhere, there is this Ayurvedic doctor that's going to give you this special remedy that's going to cure everything. And so I remember us going out of our way, going, taking this really long car ride, going to the village, going and meeting this, like, it was a very uncomfortable situation for me that like, just that whole experience and just constantly that unsolicited advice and unsolicited feedback. And also that constant probing, like, this is wrong, fix it. This is wrong, fix it. And, you know, you say that it must be so liberating and it definitely is now owning this. But the unsolicited unsolicited advice doesn't stop. Till today, I have people in my DMs like, check out this, check out this remedy, check out this, this Ayurvedic treatment, this doctor did this, not even my DMs. Um, I recently, just a couple of days ago, a family friend had sent my mom um, from, from India, a family friend and sent my mom a WhatsApp link, like, check this out. This person got their alopecia cured. And while the intentions are sweet, I appreciate the sentiment that, you know, you get a piece of information, you want to pass it along to someone that you might think is helpful, but it's just, why do we think that it's something that needs to be fixed? Why do we put so much emphasis and energy on there's something wrong with you? Fix it. This is not normal. Fix it. Just let me be. Just let the girl live. And this gets back to the main idea of everything, which is why the hell are South Asians so obsessed with hair? And why does hair define your beauty? I remember growing up and I also did the Munden thing. And so I did the Munden once and shaved my entire head or my family did. And then I had thin hair. So my family made me do the Munden again. Okay, so I'm looking at these photos recently and I'm like traumatized in these photos. I'm like held down, having a razor to my head two times because my parents think that if I don't have thick hair, then I'm not pretty. And it actually makes me wonder sometimes when I look in the mirror, I'm, I think like if I don't have hair, am I even pretty or does my hair make me pretty? And so why do you think it is that South Asians are obsessed with hair and how do these beauty standards kind of play out? I know you've dealt with a lot of firsthand experience, but I'm talking about as a community as like a whole. Yeah, I by no means am a South Asian community expert, but I think South Asians are just, we're kind of obsessed with the idea of perfection or someone looking so perfect. I'm, I'm sure within other conversations of colorism and um, all of these other things, when you look at, okay, our number one thing is how are you going to be the most perfect wife and most perfect daughter-in-law? I think all of our conversations kind of come to that. Um, if you think about it, education, girls being educated and girls being, um, you know, have good jobs and careers. That's a thing of the now. That wasn't a thing of the past. When you still look at, I know I have a lot of family that is still in India and I hear my cousins, you know, when they're trying to get married, there's proposals, rishtas coming along. And I hear my aunts and uncles say, she's too dark. She's too fat. She's too, you know, all of these things. And their son that they're trying to get married is you know, doesn't fit any of the ideal physical qualities that you would want in a man. I think you brought up such a good point with that because I was just thinking as you were mentioning this, it's the quest for perfection and the constant nitpicking. Like, you know, if you go to India or not even in India, here too, if you go to a family, you know, a dinner party, sometimes some of the aunties will look at you and they'll say, 
well, you have a little bit of hair on your face, but I have this thing. It's like rice powder and this other mix. And if you put it on your face, you take it off, then all the, all the hair will come off. And then you're like, okay, great. And they're like, but on top of that, your skin isn't really that fair either. So it puts like some more stuff. We have more suggestions for that. And they just keep giving you things over and over on this quest for perfection. But like you said, I'm not interested to know if girls get it more because I know that they do. And the hilarity is it's an inside joke or a commonly known joke that – Indian guys are typically not crazy tall, right? It's very rare that we all meet Indian guys who are over six feet tall or whatever. But you're not going to tell them to play basketball. You're not going to tell them to get like bone treatment to go get taller. And everybody, if they're not well endowed, you're not telling them to pack two more inches in their pants with other treatments that they're, you're not giving them home treatments for all those things. You know, it's just so fascinating to me that it's always directed at females. Or if you're looking broadly and non-binary than the fact that you have to put them in binary slots and you have to say, well, these are what make a girl pretty and this is what makes a boy handsome. And you're not really thinking through, okay, are are these people happy? Are these people confident? Are they feeling like they can own their story and their narrative? And can they walk into the world every day and do what they have to do without feeling shame? And we don't think about those things. And it's just so interesting to me that aunties and those the generations that have come previous. And the thing is, is that most of the time I do think that they mean well, but it comes off in such a skewed way. And it's it's so old hearing on to, like time after time what people see as a flaw in your personality or in your or in your being. And then they're just kind of projected on your personality like you're a failure. I was going to say, it kind of just brings down your self-esteem as a whole. You keep thinking, oh, I have this, quote, problem all the time. Once you said, my skin is too dark. Okay, I'll try using Fair and Lovely. Okay, now you're saying my hair is too thin. Okay, I'm going to try using some Ayurvedic thing. And there's always a, quote, problem that I have or people have. And it's just, you're like striving to chase this perfection that you can't get. And it's because of the pressures that society have always put on. And it fucking sucks. But think about this, too. Think about how many times we've gotten a 98 on an exam and our parents have asked us where those two points went. Where did they go? Yep. (laughs) It's just the same concept. And I understand that, too, with some immigrant mentality. There's a certain level of excellence that they expect in everything because they didn't know anything else. But at the same time, you times have changed. And on top of that, we've had the benefit of having a different experience in them. So we're able to own these things. Perhaps in our parents' generation, if someone had lost their hair, they wouldn't have been able to own it quite as strongly. Or if somebody was darker, they may have settled and said, okay, well, maybe I just don't deserve to get married. But now we have narratives and the power to be able to change those narratives, which is something. But at the same time, the South Asian beauty standards are so lofty that nobody is ever really going to meet them. I also think that a lot of times, whatever immigrant parents say, they don't really know what they're talking about. Because there have been times where, you know, if you're gaining a lot of weight, they'll be like, exercise. But then when you're exercising too much, they'll be like, oh, it's bad for you to exercise this much. Don't exercise that much. You're going to become nothing. And so whatever they say doesn't ever line up. So there is no pleasing. And I think that's what I've learned throughout everything. Well, bringing it back to hair, I know that we've talked a lot, obviously, about beauty standards and feeling feminine or feeling like a beautiful, proper Indian girl or whatever it is. But I don't know if you guys heard this a lot, but I used to hear all the time long hair was equivalent to you being like a goddess. And I was like, well, that what takes that away from you that you take away my divinity by cutting off my hair or losing my hair or, you know, every time I brush my hair, my hair falls out. Am I losing divinity by losing my hair? And I think that it's an incredibly high kind of uh, lofty ideal to put on something that's so superficial. And I don't know if you guys heard that a lot growing up at all, but, you know, that somehow your divinity and your value is tied to something about the way you look, particularly with hair, with Indian girls, especially, or South Asian girls. Yeah, I actually did not hear that version of it growing up. I've heard my own several many versions of why hair is such a necessity. Um, But that I wouldn't be surprised, you know, you lose your divinity, you're no longer a goddess, you're no longer a woman. You know, I've had a lot of no, I'm a straight female identifying, you know, person. And I've had a lot of people question my femininity because I don't have hair. And within the South Asian community and out of it, that's been a really big, you know, but are sometimes I get comments on my Instagram, like, are you a man? Are you a guy? Just because I don't have hair. And, um, I think a lot of times you're so 
it comes back to you and talking about that binary. You're so, you want to put everything in this bucket or that bucket. You're either pretty or you're not, you know, you're either super feminine or you're not. And I, you know, I am such not even trying to impose um, gender stereotypes or anything, but I'm a very girly girl. I've always been a huge makeup and clothes and nails and everything that you could put into the box. That was me. And so it, it was a huge kind of reality check that like, you're going to question how much woman I am because I don't have hair. I know that's so annoying to think about, but have you had any experiences with your dating life? Like have guys asked you these questions and what has that been like? Oh boy, my date. Uh, uh, do we need a whole episode for this one? <laughs> honestly, maybe. Um, <laughs> yeah, a lot, um, a lot of things there. So I think when it comes to dating, I've kind of experienced the whole spectrum when it comes to positive experiences and negative experiences. Talking on the positives, um, I've definitely met a lot of people. And just to backtrack a little bit, I, you know, after that conversation with my grandma about, you know, who are you, how are you going to get married if you don't have hair? I started thinking like along those same lines and why would I want to marry such a person? And then I realized in my dating life, this was like a filter. This filtered out so many people because this is not something that I'm hiding. If we're on Tinder, if we're on Bumble, Bill Mill, Mirchie, whatever you want to pick. <laughs> this it, is not sponsored, everyone. <laughs> The first thing that you look is how a person looks like. That's the first thing that you see. And when someone stumbles upon my profile, they see that I'm bald before they read my bio, before they even read my name. And so I think that has been sort of a blessing that I filter out everyone. There's so many people that I don't even have to deal with um, because they just swipe the other way. No complaints there. I would not have it any other way. But I think because of that, I've had a lot of like really great positive experiences. I've had a a lot of, um, you know, external validation, confidence boosters that I know, okay, this is, if I'm matching with someone, this person finds this attractive or this person finds me to be confident. On the other side of things though, I've also come to, you know, see that there's a lot of people that have fetishes about how I look. There's a lot of people that sexualize the fact that I'm bald. Um, and those have been really interesting experiences. I think I've come to kind of be able to gauge where this is going. How do you actually think that I'm a confident, powerful, attractive woman, or are you just really turned on by the fact that I'm different? And so I think that's definitely been, you know, a part of the dating experience, kind of vetting. Okay. And also as you move from casual dating to more serious dating, these are all things that you think about. Um, recently I had a very negative dating experience. I was in a relationship, um, what I thought was going to be a serious relationship. Um, I was, you know, working first year working out of college, you know, you move to a new city, you meet someone, you're like, this is it. This is, this is what, this is what's going to happen. This is my life. This is what I was meant for. And, um, what I thought was a great relationship. Um, obviously there were red flags that I saw later on, but my relationship essentially ended because of the fact that I was bald. So my boyfriend at the time, he was very attracted to the fact that I was a bald, confident woman. Um, when it was, when it just came to him, when I started being exposed to other people in his life friends, family, it became more so of a insecurity for him. He was, you know, very concerned with what other people thought of him. And in extension, he was very concerned with what other people thought of me. Um, As confident as I was, I don't think he was, you know, anywhere near that confident. He was constantly just wanting to validate his life decisions and how he was as a person. And then when we started dating, he wanted to validate the fact that I'm his girlfriend and it's okay that he's dating a bald woman. And those are all things that I realized more so after the fact, but throughout our relationship, you know, I definitely felt myself becoming less confident and more insecure because he was constantly, 
you know, bringing up these things and kind of making it, making statements about me being bald and overthinking things that I had never even thought about that weren't even in my, my head. And there came a point where he told his mom about me. And that was kind of the downhill of our relationship from there. Um, He told his mom about me. His mom said, there's no way that I'm ever going to accept this. I'm never, ever, ever going to accept this for you, for my family. Um, I have such handsome boys. You can do so much better. She had never met me. She had no idea who I was as a person. I don't even think it got to the fact of who I am and what I do and anything about me. She took one look at me and she was like, nope, not going to happen. And from there, it was very difficult. Um, After that point, the relationship didn't last long at all, maybe a a couple of weeks of trying to work through this. And then I came to realize that he was not willing, he was not accepting of it himself for him to be able to say anything to his mom. There came a point where he suggested that um, maybe I should wear a wig while meeting his family for the first time so they can get to know me as a person. And then I can take, take the wig off and um, show, show them my truth and everything about me and everything about me as who I am as a person is living in my truth, being authentic. Um, I've had traumatic experiences wearing wigs and those were shared with him. Um, And the fact that that was still suggested, the fact that, Um, it had become such a big deal and he was not able to himself accept that he was dating a bald woman. I was just kind of like, this is not going to work out. We can't do this. There's, you are minimizing everything that I am as an individual because of the fact, you know, that I don't have hair, everything else, all my accomplishments, everything else down the drain. I'm basically nothing if I don't have hair. And that's how I felt towards the end of our relationship. Well, I'm really sorry that you went through it in the first place. That's super fucked up. But on top of that, he centered himself in your traumas and then tried to make it about himself to justify being with you. And that's a pretty horrific thing to do to anybody, especially someone who may not be maybe what you envisioned or the standards that you saw as beautiful before or what might just be a little bit more different than what you're used to. And I think that that's a really good place to challenge yourself and ask your to turn inward rather than outward whenever you're facing that kind of situation. Because obviously in this particular case, this person was not, you know, introspective enough to look at themselves and say, these are the parts that I'm struggling with. And this is how I can get past them to make myself better. And rather than that, he just tried to improve you. And I think that that's, gross anyway kind of boils my blood and I really hope that I don't know his wiener falls off or something but I just you know I find that kind of judgment really awful because it it does make a very very one-dimensional case for you as a human being and I don't think that that's fair ever to do to anybody and that's just it's just horrifying to think that that's happening I feel like I've learned a lot from today's episode just with alopecia and inner beauty, beauty standards. I think as a whole, there's just a lot of moving parts of this conversation. And I love your social media so much and how open you are about everything. But before we wrap up today's episode, I do want to know like, what is one takeaway you want listeners to hold close when they end this episode and go on with their lives? Is it more centered around our societal views of everything and especially beauty? Is it more around something that you've been through that you would like to see from other people? What exactly is it? A huge thing that I've learned is what could be a terrible thing to someone else was such a beautiful thing to me in my life. Um, You know, everyone thinks you were so quick to, you know, oh, I'm so sorry that you went through this. I I get a lot of pity when I share my story or I get a lot of um, sympathy, like, oh, I'm so sorry. This must have been so difficult. And while it was, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that this happened. Um, I think that my alopecia was really my life's biggest blessing. Um, It really, there's no way that I could have been the person that I am today and also live the life that um, I do the way that I see things. You know, I think that we're so quick to often pass judgment on other people and express um, 
opinions on their life and how they live it without not knowing anything about it. I think I do that as well. And I am one of those people that gets a lot of judgment. You know, I get a lot of that. Um, I walk by and someone's going to, I know someone's going to say something. And even though I get all that judgment, I, I still partake in this never ending cycle of sharing my opinions and also passing judgment myself. And I think that's a really big thing that constantly grounds me is when I catch myself doing that. I think everyone, people used to pass judgments on you. You know, everyone has their own story. It's not really your place to, to pass those judgments. And also we look at being different as such a bad thing. We look at different as um, that's, that's so weird. Oh, she's different. Oh, that experience. And if I look inwards, being different has been such a great thing for me. So that person could be so happy in their life being different. Um, so just let them let them live. I think the biggest thing is just let let the person live. And um, it's all these things are so much easier said than done. But really, like love yourself for who you, who you are. That's been the biggest thing in my journey. And surround yourself with people who love you. You know, if, if someone is bringing you down, if someone is passing all these opinions on your life, maybe they don't belong there. And again, easier said than done, but that's really all that matters at the end of the day. So listeners, if you came here to hear a sob story, this ain't it. This is the story of Nihar and how she owned her beauty, owns alopecia and loves it. And so I think that's the biggest takeaway. Like you just said, I think people come here and think, oh, you're going to tell a story about the sad story that you have and everything that you've been through, but it's not about that. It's just about how you're owning it, what you're doing now, and how you continue to proceed in your personal life and throughout social media and stuff. One of the things that you brought up that keeps sticking with me is the fact that you have not only mentioned owning your story, but the fact that if your parents said, oh, or someone said to your parents, oh, Nihar is bald, and they were like, yeah, we know. I think it's something that we all forget whenever – I don't know if you guys have ever seen the ads for Aerie. Um, They tried to start doing more inclusive ads f- for their lingerie lines, especially with their bras and their underwear. And they have women of different body types, of different skin tones. They have people with vitiligo. And uh, I believe they ha- may have had models with alopecia before. And I know that they had models with col- colostomy bags and with diabetes pumps. And I remember when I saw this, I just kept thinking, this is beautiful because it's finally a reflection of a person's story rather than just a reflection of their looks. I think outward appearances are often just a reflection of all the different things that people have gone through throughout their lives. And it's so important to take that into consideration whenever you look at somebody and immediately judge that perhaps they have a really powerful, really wild, really cool story behind it. Or maybe they just had some struggles that they were able to overcome that you can now admire them for because they're getting to wear these battle scars or these huge achievements on their body in whatever way that looks, you know, whether that's a colostomy bag, whether that's a diabetes pump, whether that is shaving your head and owning the fact that you have alopecia, whether that's vitiligo, whatever it is, there are many, many ways to own your story. And this is one of them. And I think that that ultimately becomes incredibly empowering by watching you for other people who are going through things. I know that you also mentioned when you and I talked on the phone that by you standing up on social media, a lot of other people who went through this entire experience through their childhoods concurrently with you aside, like like next to you, were finally able to own it too and say, I actually went through it too, but I didn't have anybody to talk to you about it. Yeah, and I think that's a huge thing that I've learned starting, you know, speaking up on social media, sharing my experiences. So many people have reached out, either people that I personally knew or complete strangers on the internet saying, this is my experience too. This is, I'm also about bald South Asian women and I've been feeling the same exact way. And you express my thoughts into, into words. And so many people have reached out. A lot of people are not where I am yet. You know, they're at different points in their journey. They they haven't been able to accept um, the fact that they're bald. And I remember those days. I remember the days that I would just, every single day, I would just pray to God for one thing. Please let my hair grow back. Please let my hair grow back. There was nothing else I would think of. I wouldn't even get to the next thing because I thought, I can't even get there if I don't have this. 
I can't even accomplish anything else if I don't have this. And so they reach out to me and they reach out expressing like, how do I do this? You've done this. You've shaved your head. How do I do this? And all of these things are so easier said than done. I can't, you know, walk someone through their journey. They have to live it themselves, but I can give them, I can show them, you know, you can do this. You can shave your head and everything will still be okay. And uh, granted, I'm blessed with my family. I'm blessed with the people that I surround myself with that they accept me for who I am. And I understand that everyone may not have a situation or a support system like that. But I think that just being open and, you know, I always say that I want to be the representation that I didn't have growing up, you know, in growing up, looking at YouTube videos, makeup um, tutorials, and all of these things just recently in the past handful of years, we have this uptake of South Asian creators and influencers and beauty and fashion and all of these amazing things where we're creating space for ourselves and creating this representation. But still in this day and age with all of these amazing South Asian women that I see on my social media platforms, I still don't see anyone that looks like me. And I think that um, I'm so blessed that I'm have accepted this, that I've come to a point in my life where I'm truly comfortable in my skin, that I could be able to express this to other people. And then they can come and see that they can also do the same thing. And everyone's journey is completely different. It's not going to look the same, but at least having someone to say like, okay, she's also bald. If you want to, you know, like if you're making a PowerPoint for your family, like reasons why I want to shave my head, look, she's a bald Indian girl and she's fine. She's doing okay. You know, I have a career. I I, you know, my love life is pretty all right, you know, all of these things. So I think it's, it's really been a blessing and being able to see that there are so many people, especially South Asian women that are going through this and you would never know because we're so hush hush about it. Well, thank you, Nihar, for normalizing this conversation. I hope our listeners actually take something away from this, but before we wrap up, I want to say thank you one more time for being on our podcast. If you want to follow her on Instagram, it's fabulous. Follow her at Nihar Sachdeva. That's N-E-E-H-A-R-S-A-C-H-D-E-V-A on Instagram. Also follow at The Woke Desi on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Check out our website, www.thewokedesi.com. Till next week, get woke, stay woke. This is the Woke Daisy.